I want to talk about just FEM and the journey to get here. This has been a long road. Um, I want to talk about a bunch of opportunities for builders and different kinds of applications that are possible. Um, and I want to also give a, a quick snapshot at what building startups in this space looks like um, and how this community has, been, has formed one of the most uh, helpful environments for uh, building new things. So um, we, we're at the last stages of what is, has been a very long road. We started designing the beginnings of the FEM in late 21, early 22, uh, even building on ideas that have been around for over four or five years. Uh, so the FEM team building this from, um, uh, from scratch has been hard at work for um, close to two years now. And this major milestone is gonna be this huge moment for the entire network um, and for all of the builders uh, in, the, in the whole ecosystem. Uh, now, the, the FEVM going live on mainnet is gonna be the opening of uh, the floodgates for all kinds of applications on the ecosystem. Uh, you're finally gonna be able to imbue your data with programmability um, in a way that so far has not been uh, possible across, across Web3. So that's gonna be uh, super exciting. A bunch of really new, cool use cases are gonna emerge. Um, there's some milestones beyond that, so things like um, milestone 2.2, which is brings Wasm uh, smart contracts and so on, uh, and then later some some other improvements. So there's still you know some long road uh, ahead, uh, but this is going to be like the major big milestone that uh, the culmination of you know two years of work for a ton of people. Uh, so I think a lot of people have spoken about all the different kinds of things that FEM unlocks. Uh, I want to highlight a few here. So things like data DAOs, uh, we've been talking a lot about them. Um, and they've been kind of difficult to build between other chains and Filecoin. I think one of the key components that was missing is the ability to couple the DAO activity with the smart contracts themselves, storing the data, um, or potentially computing over the data. So I think those, um, we, we're likely gonna start seeing those, these data DAOs emerging. Um, there's a whole uh, range of, um, I kind of gave this talk at Phil Lisbon talking about a request for startups. Um, go watch that because there's a ton of different ideas here for builders. Um, I'm especially uh, keen to see different kind of social applications now being possible. Um, so far, social has not really taken off in Web3 because it's extremely difficult to deal with the scale and volume of data um, and computation that you need to actually power a social application. So um, now with this, uh, we're starting to get um, to have all of the primitives that you need to build these kinds of social applications. Not all of them yet. I think some of the computer over data networks still have to land uh, to be able to do some of, some of the things. Um, but we should be able to, to start now some of the early style um, Web2 social applications and be able to build them at this scale. Um, I think games are also going to be extremely important for this community. Um, I, haven't, I don't see that many game developers here. Raise your hand if you're a game developer. Empty, see, that's a bug. We gotta fix that. Uh, I, I think games are gonna be a, a, huge, a huge part of this. Um, uh, because so far games in other blockchains haven't been able to deal with putting all of the game assets themselves into the chain itself, or being able to start using um, the outputs of smart contracts in the game logic um, and altering entire worlds and so on. So those kinds of things will, will suddenly become possible. That'll be pretty, pretty interesting. Um, the, the, the FEM website has a whole get started area, so for the builders in the room that are just getting started, uh, go, go check this out. Uh, and the Space Warp uh, program uh, ha with hackathons and grants and so on is there for you uh, to help you get started. Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about how the FEM fits into the broader Filecoin uh, vision. So the mission of Filecoin is to build a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information that requires bringing programmability to the data. So the FEM is like the linchpin piece that connects um, the adding of data and preservation of the data to making it useful for the world. So in, in addition to just being able to archive it and store it or serve it, you wanna be able to do something useful with that data. And the FEM is the first part um, of that picture. So we've talked about the Filecoin master plan in terms of these three steps. Step one is to build the world's largest decentralized source network. We've done that, so you know, huge. Actually, round of applause for all the people that have worked so hard for a long time to make this happen. Um, and step two, we're do, we're making great progress on step two. We've onboarded. Um, I think have we broken two hundred petabytes of any six hundred petabytes of it? Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, it was looking at some old slides, and I, um, yeah, 600 petabytes, that's amazing. That's huge. That's enormous. We're almost going to hit a next byte. When are we going to hit a next byte? Probably by June. Yeah. You heard it here. Um, that's an enormous amount of data. Uh, just to put that into context, um, we, we've did, done these estimations of like the scale of certain data sets. And so things like YouTube, for example, are in like the single exabytes, like maybe five, maybe seven exabytes of content. Um, and so that, that is a testament to the scale that you can achieve uh, with Pathfinder, which is way, way outside the rest of Web3, right? So most of the data in Web3 outside of Filecoin is something like 10 petabytes or less. So that's kind of the, you know, the massive scale difference. So let's go back to compute. Uh, the FEM is what is going to enable all of this computation to, to arrive. So um, there's also this great diagram from Raul, um, who's been uh, shaping the vision for FEM as the kind of computation over state that's required to be able to build other kinds of um, computation on top. So uh, you first deploy the FEM to enable the smart contracts to work, and then on top of that, um, you can then build all kinds of other computation uh, systems. So think of um, you know, compute over data projects like Bacalao um, and other kinds of uh, things where you, you can now run large scale computing pipelines on top of your data. So um, we first launched the FEM and that's kind of the, the first um, piece of bringing computation and that seeds the ground for all these other larger scale compu um, compute pieces. Um, so I think one of the things that everybody here should be paying attention to is how this is space is going to emerge because um, we're, we're going to start to see lots of different kinds of computational oriented L2s appear on top of Filecoin. So, so things like um, th things that kind of map into this large space of, of, of different kinds of computational networks um, that, that achieve verifiability and privacy in different ways um, will likely fit as different kinds of L2s. So there's going to be a great opportunity as soon as FVM lands for people to create those L2s um, to, to bring that kind of computation into, into the space not just operating over smart contract data, which is very small, but now operating over large scale, large data sets and large user data. So you know, today, most of the Web3 space, when it, we're thinking about zero knowledge proofs and so on, we tend to think about it in terms of smart contracts and doing ver verifying smart contracts. We're not yet talking about verifying the activity directly on say a social network or verifying the activity on a, say like a, like a housing marketplace to check that like inspections actually happened or um, the data collected about a, a specific from a meter is correct and so on. So all of that is gonna be, be made possible by these computational um, L2s. And there's not that many people building these yet. So th there's, there's a huge open field here uh, for people seeking to, to build these, these kinds of things. Um, one other thing worth hi uh, highlighting is that um, Filecoin has always been highly collaborative with many other ecosystems and we try to build bridges to many other um, chains. And so think of uh, being able to mix, now with the FEM, it's gonna make it dramatically easier to um, interconnect Filecoin storage to these other chains. So this also creates opportunities for launching kind of Filecoin specific smart contracts in all of these other networks uh, connect, making it so that you can call out perpetual storage on Filecoin from those networks. So you can imagine calling um, uh, contracts from any one of these networks straight in, writing through to Filecoin. And so the, the, the FEM was the missing piece. Now that we have that, we're, we're gonna be able to do this. And so using all of these things, we can finally get to large scale Web3 applications. Um, the entire Web3 space is, is um, not yet able to produce something like YouTube, something like TikTok, something like um, Instagram and Twitter and so on. And, and this is like the lar a very large step towards that. Once we do this and we build the computational networks, then at that point we'll be ready for those kinds of applications. So this, this is the next step. And then after that, the, um, the computational networks. Cool, so that's, that's the, how the FEM fits in the Falcon Master Plan. The last thing I wanted to talk about um, is just how to start startups in this ecosystems. You heard a lot from many builders earlier, um, but I w just wanted to kind of break down the space into a set of steps. Um, I gave a version of this talk at ETH India, and it was one of the things that um, helped a number of people to get started in their journey, so I figured I would repeat it here. Uh, so first off, you know, you have to start by learning a ton about the world. This means um, usually this starts with people either in, in um, other jobs or in school and so on learning a ton about um, technology and development and products and so on. Uh, then people start experimenting with ideas and this looks like 
a, a very kind of hack-oriented stage where you're just trying um, to build many different kinds of components. This is where hackathons are extremely useful because hackathons give you this forcing function to get started to build things, meaning it, it creates the forcing function for a small group of people, like whether it's one to four people, working together, building a thing with a deadline. Like you're forced to make sure to produce a thing and show it and deploy it. Um, and you're forced to answer all kinds of questions about me. Who's going to use this thing? How are they going to interact with it? You're going to get real-time feedback from a lot of people trying the thing. And it's going to ex expose you and force you to learn tons of stuff to build your hack. So, so I've often seen hackathons as one of the biggest source of startups um, in, in the world. Now, after that moment, if you find one of these, if you go through these hackathons and you find something that maybe has some legs, um, and you'll get that as feedback from, from other people in the hackathon or judges and so on, um, you can then choose to pursue that and start working on it more, and you get into like this moment of validation. Like you want to validate that idea and, and see if it is actually gonna gonna work in the market, um, and that's where you turn your hack into um, kind of like a minimum product. Not yet a minimum viable product. You can't actually like necessarily launch that into the world, but at least you can get it into like the shape of what could potentially be a product. And this is where you want to. Um, talk to and, and, and potential users and so on to really assess whether the thing you're building is going to solve somebody's problem and is going to create um, a, viable, a viable product, a viable business. So from there, once you have that picture, you're now kind of like startup ready. And, and you can, at that moment, when you have a sense of how that product can actually be viable, um, you can now start the startup. And you go, you translate your minimum product into a minimum viable product. Um, this is a great space for accelerators. So this is where accelerators really fit in. Um, they help you get from like you know the early hacks and, and kind of the early validation stages into starting the startup, bu um, building the vi minimum viable product, um, and starting to scale it. And then from there, um, you go into getting traction. So like the next thing that you need to really focus on is how do you launch your thing and get traction um, as relevant to your product. So some products you can kind of get done quickly build them, and then start building a network. Other products take a lot longer to build, and so traction might be, uh, might be different. It might be in terms of like um, letters of interest or, or um, uh, intents to use a thing and so on. So it kind of varies by product, but you kind of like from accelerator to um, this kind of like pre-seed stage is when you want to start getting a ton of traction in your MVP. And you, you're, you're starting to get the signs of early product market fit. You're starting to get find the areas of the market that like really care about your product. And then from there, you get into kind of like the seed stage of startups, which, um, which, which is kind of like where you're finding your strong sense of product market fit, and at that point you start growing the business. Um, you know, in in ancient times, like you know, 15 years ago, pre-seed and seed would have been like seed and Series A, but nowadays because all of the scales have like shifted, um, now we sort of like call them this way. Um, I guess you know, in even more ancient history than that, like 20, 25 years ago, seed would have been like the early validation part, but whatever. Um, one of the Key things, though, with all of this is that our community has built a super successful way of supporting people across all of these stages. So there's programs dedicated to support people um, going through each one of these stages in the journey of building, building a startup. Um, you heard about them from the panel that just happened. Um, you heard a lot about uh, people in the kind of startup, start the startup stage, um, in the accelerators area. And um, you also heard from many of the founders and builders who are like already now growing, growing the business. So I wanted to take a moment to highlight folks like who here kind of like started a bus business, or started a product, started a company in this community. Can you raise your hand? That's awesome! Huge congratulations! And um, how many of you started with a hackathon in this in this community? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so there's a huge uh, testament to this community to be able to build this entire um, uh, structure to help uh, folks. Uh, I wanted to just invite a couple of people to just come up for a moment and just share a little bit about their stories of how they got started with those hackathons. Um, Ayush, do you want to come up and tell us a little bit? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Juan. Uh, so my journey has been, uh, we participated in ETH Global Hackfest. So I think the similar structure, exact this, this is the replica which we had created, where uh, it was ETH Global Hack FS 2020, done by Protocol Labs and Ethereum, Ethereum in general. Where the idea was pretty simple, it was 30-day hackathon. And uh, what we are building essentially at Hurl01 is a communication toolkit for Web3. 
uh, where we saw that everybody was talking about decentralization, Web 3.0, but all their meetings were happening over Zoom, Google Meet, or Microsoft Teams. And that's where they said, hey, you know what? If we are talking so much about Web 3.0, why not build a platform which essentially has imbibes that kind of culture into it? So that's how we built Huddle 01 in those 30 days of hackathon. Post that hackathon, we got into we got grants. Basically, in hack hackathon, we won a couple of prizes. We won audio track from PL. Uh, that was one of our that led us to bootstrap our team, build a team, and then essentially we got a couple of more grants. Post that, we got into Techion Accelerator, and also into Longash Accelerator. That saw it all the journey of how to build the product, how to do customer interviews. That started off. Uh, the pivots happened. So Huddle started off as a Web three. Like we wanted to use the infrastructures ready like Filecoin for recording. So at Huddle01, if you just type it right now, you can just do all the things you can do on Google Meet, Zoom. You can use your guest login or meta join by your MetaMask or your wallets and do all the things you can do on these platforms. But your recording gets stored over IPFS on the hot layer and Filecoin on the cold layer. You can use LifePure for doing RTMP out and a lot of other things like NFT as an AR filter and all those other things as well. And that that's how it all started off with and then Post our hackathon journey, we actually raised our first fund. We raised our angel round, I think, which Juan also mentioned about. That was the get traction stage. We raised some 50K from a couple of angels. And in all this process, as Juan was also mentioning about, we got help from the layer of from ETH Global uh, HackFS, where we got like help from protocol labs for the grants to how to the office arts, which was really, really important for us, to the stage of grants, to the stage of Accelerator again, where we got brewed completely. We were pretty, really raw at that time. In the last two years, we actually we matured a lot in that uh, in that format. Post that, you, we got help in terms of building a team, in terms of legal compliance, name it. So I think in terms of the help which you get, all the builders who are here, who are starting off with, the kind of help you get from the protocol uh, labs team in general, in all the myriad of departments you can think of, is supremely underrated. I recently tweeted about that as well. And that's how we actually raised. So I just wanted to like give a big round of applause to the Protocol Labs Network team. It's been great, the kind of help we got. We wouldn't have been here uh, if Protocol Labs hadn't been there. Now we are at a stage of where we raised our pre-seed round, our seed round, and now we are a team of 22 people and building strong. We build the, uh, the product layer, the infrastructure layer, and also the protocol layer now. So yeah, thanks to the team, and thanks, Juan, for having me. Yeah. Thank, thank you. That's, that's awesome. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to come up as well? Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, a little bit of a different story, but that's a, a really inspiring one. Um, generally, I think this was in 2018 uh, or 2017. I was working at Consensus, and um, I learned of IPFS and Filecoin, and a few months later, quit to start an IPFS dev shop. And um, you know, about six or eight months into doing that, Protocol Labs hit me up, and they said, "Hey, do you want to build the wallet?" And I was like, y "Yeah." And then it was like, do you want to run some nodes? And yeah. It was like, do you want to build the multi-sig and help us with the SAP? It was, yeah. And like, this was the birth of Glyph. Um, and basically, like, we had so much support uh, from the Protocol Labs and Filecoin Foundation teams. Uh, we would not be in the business that we are if we didn't have that support. Um, but it looks really similar to this. Like, I learned a lot about the world, the consensus. Um, I experimented with ideas when I was, you know, Running the dev shop, I worked with a lot of really like moonshot uh, Web3 protocols that didn't make it um, until eventually we got hit up about grants to build the wallet and, and the multi-sig. And you know, now like we've had time and, and support from Protocol Labs to focus on uh, the product that we feel really strongly convicted about, which is you know uh, staking infrastructure. And so now we've kind of made it to the uh, I don't know if we're in the grow the business stage yet, but like I feel like we're right we there. Are. We're right there. We're right there. Yeah, we're starting to think about marketing. Um, so you know, it's all fun. But thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, I, I welcome you to like just get involved. There's so much opportunity. This ecosystem is really mature, but it's also it needs a lot of help, and and we need more smart, bright people to uh, to contribute. So yeah, come join. Cool. So I wanted to end by um, flashing some of these again. Like, there's a ton of really interesting things to build, um, enabled by FBM, and just give a huge. I want to end with like a huge round of applause for all of the people involved in making FBM a reality, because this has been a two-year-ish journey. Uh, so thank you so much to everybody working on FBM.